Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today's webinar will explore the findings from a global survey of a thousand IT and security leaders, which composed the foundation for the 2023 State of Cyber Defense Report. The report was named the false positive of trust and no spoilers to anyone that haven't read it yet. Uh, it highlights challenges with both lack of and over trust. So stay tuned for more. Before we get going, um, just a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. You will receive access to the recording in a couple of days. Uh, a copy of the slides is available in the handouts section of the GoToWebinar client. Um, you will see that client floating somewhere in one of your monitors. Through that client, you can not only download the slides under the handout section, you uh, can also ask questions via the chat. Um, we will do a Q&A at the end, and of course, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but you are welcome to drop questions uh, as you think of them, and uh, we'll post them to the speakers at the end. And of course, if you haven't downloaded the report yet, we recommend you do so using the link on the screen. Um, it's on .crow.com slash SOCD23, and you will find the report and you can follow along with us. With that, let me turn to our speakers, Pierce and Claire and Ed Starkey, and please, Pearson, take it away. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Leo, and good morning. Really happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Pearson Clare, Managing Director, Kroll Cyber. I'm in my seventh year with Kroll, more than 15 years in InfoSec. Now, my first four years at Kroll were spent running an incident response team where I ran 500 intrusion responses, helping organizations out of the absolute worst days of their lives. And now I'm working in our cyber managed services team in a special projects capability, and also helping our largest customers stay left of boom and ahead of the risk curve. I'm also a professor at the University of Southern California. And now to flip it across the pond, my colleague, Ms. Red Starkey. Good afternoon to everybody um, that, that might be outside of, um, outside of the US. Um, so yes, uh, Ed Starkey, I'm part of what's called the, the proactive team here at Kroll. So um, if Pearson um, has spent uh, his time doing the 500 incidents, uh, I try to avoid uh, or try to en enable clients to avoid um, having those incidents. So in my time at Kroll, um, so for the past two and a half years, um, I'm a virtual CISO. Um, so I work really closely with clients, um, developing long-term relationships, strategies, for managing cyber risk, um, and I also work a lot in the m and sector as well. So why do we say that trust is clearly an issue? Well, with cyber threats increasing in number and sophistication, we see organizations are layering on cybersecurity platforms, pulling from multiple different threat intelligence sources, <clears throat> moving to the cloud, outsourcing so many different key services. And to navigate this evolving and changing landscape, trust is imperative. There needs to be trust in teams, trust in technology, trust in your intelligence sources, trust with suppliers and third-party vendors. And the degree in which businesses trust their technology can have wide-ranging impacts on how effectively organizations handle cybersecurity challenges. And where trust is lacking, there end up being far-reaching consequences for cyber resilience. And so it's clear that there's a critical balance in how much and where trust should be placed. Organizations that report high levels of trust also claim that they have high levels of cyber maturity. However, when looking deeper, the actions of these self-reported mature organizations seem to suggest that their cyber defense should and could be improved. The challenge being faced is what cyber maturity truly means and how this can be used to build trust against key stakeholders. And so throughout this webinar, we'll look to understand the current state of cyber defense, the levels of organizational trust, and how true cyber maturity links to trust in facilitating organizations staying ahead of the curve in a constantly evolving threat landscape. We face this report on the response from a thousand senior security decision makers from across the world in organizations from 50 million to $10 billion. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, Let's look at how trust is um, is perceived within within the organisation. And the first thing we've got on on the left hand side here is 37% of respondees said that they are they feel completely trusted. 
um, which is fascinating. I mean, everybody on this call probably has insights into into cyber security, um, whether they're practitioners or, or or work, you know, just very closely with, with with individuals in the industry. And we know that a huge percentage of organisations are being subject to successful attacks. So we've got thirty seven percent across the board saying they feel completely or completely protected. And on the flip side, we're seeing that only 4% of respondents reported no security instance in the past year. So we're seeing a really interesting positioning of, of what trust actually means within an organization versus, versus reality. And we've got regional differences as well. So um, North America has a high level of trust that the, the organizations are, are better protected. Um, yeah, Pearson, I don't know if you've got any any additional kind of input into into this slide and, and what it covers. Yeah, well, I think you you teed on it exactly of this. We're completely we trust we're completely protected, and yet we had five major security incidents. And so let's unpack that a little bit. Our 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 definition is the respondents answered was uh, an incident that resulted in data compromise or financial impact, and so. When you see that, there, there seems to be a uh, perhaps being out of alignment, uh, an incongruity between the reality of the security incidents versus their understanding of their own organization. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that ties really nicely into some research that we conducted um, last year as well around um, CFOs and the perception of trust as well. However, Let's have a look at some of the areas where there are the biggest challenges um, for, for organizations. And we're seeing the lack of trust in employees to be able to avoid incidents. Um, this is you know, fascinating from where we're sitting, but we, we do understand and we do acknowledge, I think as professionals, as practitioners, that there's a lot of fast moving pieces within, within the space. The, the tools and tactics and techniques that attackers use are constantly changing and evolving. So there is a real need to continue to be um, kind of informed and kept up to date with, um, with, with how to identify um, and avoid being you know, fully subject to these attacks. So no surprise to me that um, there's a lack of trust in employees being able to avoid incidents. The next one I guess that I'd like to talk about really is um, a lack of trust in threat intelligence. Um, I mean, threat intelligence covers so many different things. Um, and maybe we're looking at the potential um, uh, overselling of what threat intelligence is and the lack of the organizations to consume it properly. Um, but again, Pearson, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, in this space. Well, you, you know, our, our colleague Sean Straw says it best. He goes, security is not zero or one. Security is not yes or no. And we're going to keep this theme going today. But what that means is humans are not the only control. There are many technical controls left of the human. There are many technical controls right of the human. And so if you're relying purely on your employees to not fall victim, interestingly, that's probably why that plus, well, too many tools is one of the many reasons that we help 3,000 organizations per year through very difficult days because of how they're allocating their people, their process, and their technology. Same with threat intelligence. You know, we, we, we see an evolution of threat intelligence. So many organizations still think of threat intel as raw IOCs, malicious domain names, and malicious IP addresses. And that really changed six plus years ago when attackers moved to standing up brand new infrastructure for every targeted attack. And now they're going back to what's old is new again. They're going back to very old sites that have not been patched in some time, taking those sites over and using those with historical positive trust scores in order to launch their attacks or at least host their attacks. So it's an, an interesting evolution of, of how organizations protect themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, we're seeing challenges of trust within, I guess, within the operational element within uh, cybersecurity teams, but then we're also seeing improvement needed uh, in trust from senior leadership as well. So 95% of information security decision makers do not feel as having senior leadership trust them. I mean, we've seen recently in the last 
couple of years, it seems to be coming out more and more and more that we've got significant burnout in, in cybersecurity broadly. We've got CISOs that are, you know, the, the, the kind of resigning and retiring and moving on elsewhere. And I can't help but think or wonder whether this is 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 contributing to it. Being in a being in an organisation where you don't feel like you have the the trust from from senior leadership, um, we see it in organisations that we go into, it, and it is exhausting. And there's a lot of effort that goes into you know making sure that we establish that relationship and trust. And we'll talk about it kind of later on. But I think the the human element here is is absolutely key. Yeah, right. And Ed, the the mark of success for a CISO is radically different than the mark of a success for other risk management leaders in an organization. A CISO is told, your mark of success is no incidents. And if you have no incidents, perhaps we trust you. And if you have security incidents, we, perhaps we don't trust you. You tell that to a, a general, a, a GC, a general counsel candidate and tell them, your mark of success is no lawsuits against the company. You tell uh, your physical security person, your mark of success is no loss theft or other loss incidents. You look at somebody who oversees the entire fleet of corporate vehicles and you tell them your mark of success is your employees can't get into car accidents. And, and the rest of those risk management spaces say, no, 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 we manage risk. We don't eliminate risk. And yet perhaps for the CISO, you're told your mark of success is eliminating risk, not managing risk. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one thing that we'll definitely touch upon a little bit more. So trust being um, misplaced um, is something that we also asked about in the survey and it's got some 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 interesting uh, results that hopefully we can kind of go into in a little bit more detail. But um, on the left hand side there, we, we can see that the most trusted method for IT and security decision makers in is having employees being able to avoid cyber attacks. So we've got a real difference here between what we said earlier about not trusting employees to avoid versus those placing a huge emphasis on, on individuals um, being able to avoid, um, avoid attacks. And then as we go down on the right hand side, we've got a concern about the accuracy of cyber security alerts, the effectiveness of the tools, and maybe to pick up on that in a bit. And, threat intelligence data, the accuracy of it. Um, so uh, this is this for me is absolutely fascinating. We've seen real insights into, into leadership perception uh, and cyber security across, across the industry. But the accuracy of alerts here screams to me that, you know, alert fatigue. Um, and I know you've got something to say around the configuration of um, particular tools. Um, so yeah, again, interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, you know, it's not, Yes or no. Do you have a tool? It's do you have the foundational controls in place? And how have you configured those tools? We frequently come into organizations that have the alphabet soup of tools, a SIM to an EDR, to an MDR, to an XDR, to a PDQ and an FYZ and they're running in their default out of the box configuration, those organizations are confused as to why they had a security instance. And one, in many places, uh, they are putting a stronger, uh, a stronger emphasis on the employees avoiding the attacks because, well, the alerts are not great because the cybersecurity tools have not been tuned. The foundational controls are not in place and thus they're not, perhaps it's, it's, the organization believes that the threat intelligence is not accurate, but perhaps they don't know how to actually implement said threat intelligence data. So it's a, it's a unique challenge that creates this, this circle of pain, if you will. Yeah, and I think when you're looking at tools, we, I know we'll talk about it in a little bit, but there's so many, as you said, the complexity associated with becoming, uh, I guess, and the time effort in becoming an expert in, in all the tools that an organization may have is astronomical. So, you know, making sure there's um, um, really, you know, really good understanding of the capabilities of um, tools and also the internal resources is, is absolutely key. And so the most interesting next part of our research really confirmed 
something that we've seen in the IR space for a very, very long time. And that is that multiple security tools don't mean fewer breaches. And what was fascinating, and we're going to slice this two ways, is the average number of cybersecurity platforms used in most organizations is about eight. And when you have eight different platforms, you need staff who are deeply, deeply, deeply knowledgeable in each of those platforms so that when D-Day comes and those team members need to track, an, uh, track a threat actor, rapidly figure out what they've done and eject them, if they're not quickly moving and quickly fluent in all of those tools, they end up having issues. And what we see is that more platforms equal more problems. The more platforms an organization has or had, the more security incidents they had, which is fascinating because so many people say, I need X tool, I will go buy X tool. I need Y capability, so I will install Y capability. Not deeply understanding that tuning the configuration, wrapping the configuration to allow for exactly the level of access that's needed by your organization is what needs to be programmed in, not the out of the box. Because if you're buying your technology stack based upon big advertisements in an airport, you're buying a technology stack that just happens to have a big marketing budget, not one that will level up your information security program. And Ed, I'm sure you've seen quite a few security programs perhaps like this in your years. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I think about this and where I thought about it when I first saw this is it's like trying to cook a good meal, but having multiple pots on the go, multiple ovens, and in order to get the timing right, you're having to, to look at multiple sources on a continuous basis. It's difficult, it's complicated, it's very, very tricky to do. Um, yes, there are some people, some organizations that can achieve it. However, the amount of effort and the resources that go into that, um, it, you know, is significant. So yes, I'm always a little bit concerned when I go to one of organizations and I see some tooling and I see it not being optimized or you know utilized fully, and the response to uh, to, to questions around what are you doing next, Y and Z, um, is to to buy more tools. Um, absolutely, it's a, it's a red flag for me. <clears throat> Wonderful. So looking at the causes, the the cause and effect of a lack of trust. So. A lack of communication. This seems really, really obvious, but but what we're seeing is that respondents said that a lack of communication upwards and downwards leads to a reduction in, in in trust. And this is so, you know, this as a GRC individual, as somebody that that, that engages with, with with clients on a daily basis and looks to understand the problems and then you know break it down and articulate it in a way that that, that stakeholders understand. This is perfect for me i mean it's a real shame and it's something that i think as a as an industry we need to get better at you know we, we operate in the background or you know quiet running it is, is often the you know the, the mindset if it, you know you don't shout about it the only reason you communicate is if something goes wrong but we know that executives that get concerned if they don't hear anything if they're not being proactively managed and communicated to um, within this is within this uh, I guess this this graph we've got some other things that that, that might speak directly to to your area Pearson so repeated security incidents you know undermining um, trust within within an organization and a blame culture as well, and a blame culture as well so yeah kicking it over to you to to, to hear your thoughts right and I, I think these ones that you flagged on are are so appropriate the repeated cybersecurity incidents, a blame culture, and let's also add in too few people to do the job. <clears throat> and I think all of these are interestingly connected because if you have repeated cybersecurity incidents, already that begins to shine a light on your organization of what's going wrong, what can we do different? In many cases, there may already be a burnout challenge, and that begins to mean that too few people exist to do the job, which then everyone's pointing fingers and this cycle and the cycle repeats. The interesting thing here certainly also is the limited te technical capabilities. Is that then 
based on a mix of both people. Because you don't have the people to operate the tools, you've ended up making your organization simply too complex. And because it's too complex, is that what gives the attackers the thin line to thread through, either from a, from a nation state perspective where they're stealing intellectual property, or from a financially motivated perspective, a ransomware, a, a BEC, a wire fraud, where simply they're looking to conduct a financial transaction at your expense? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you mentioned there was this, this the, the consequence of you know, great complexity. Um, as a cybersecurity professional, there's nothing I hate more than overly complex environments or processes. Um, somebody said that the uh, the aim of a good engineer is to come up with the simplest possible solution. And I feel like that potentially is lost within the field that, that we work in. So yes, complexity, um, complexity equals cost. For me, it's a, a resource cost, it's financial cost, it's, it's additional kind of cybersecurity challenges. Um, and you can see that this is broken down by, by top answers by country. So, you know, the next one that, that we look at is the slow instant response. Again, something that, that you flagged, Pearson, around um, the, the challenges of having this complex environment and then having a, a, a slow response driven by the, the I guess, some of the things that you've already flagged. Um, but yeah, any any other points on, on this particular slide? Well, I think the last slide perfectly hands off to this one, right? If your if your infosec team, if your internal response team is continuously having uh, the, their capabilities questioned, rather than waving the flag early on saying uh, this is a big one, we're going to need some help, perhaps they're going to look to handle that internally, so that they don't get those additional questions, so they don't get those prying eyes. But if it actually was a big one, they probably need the help. And now they're, they've backed themselves into a corner of, well, we thought we could handle this, but now the attackers are simply that tsunami that is, that is overwhelming us. And that goes hand in hand with an organization that is complex, too much complexity in terms of both technology and also perhaps oversight interest. And together, those slow down a process and the attacker doesn't need to completely understand the complex network. The attacker only needs to figure out a way to conduct their actions on objectives. So as we continue this discussion, we're gonna pull it up a level. And what we discovered was that not all security leaders perhaps understand what their security tools are protecting against. <clears throat> And I think we're all familiar with EDR, Endpoint Detection Response Telemetry. EDR tools, which uh, I like to say are this giant vacuum cleaner. They, they, they collect process execution telemetry. They collect file system modification activity. They collect oh, oh, just a, a wide range of, of network activity uh, emerging from a host. And in the year 2023, EDR technology is the best way to detect that an attacker is on an endpoint of yours. It's also uh, leading EDR tools give you the technology horsepower to go conduct the investigation based both on the EDR telemetry and also on the ability to pull forensic artifacts from host and allows you to conduct the remediation, right? That's why it's endpoint detection and response. And so we asked senior security leaders about their, their understanding of, of EDR technology. 39% uh, said EDR enables you to remediate the symptoms, but not understand the root cause of compromise. 38% said all response can be made with EDR. 22% said EDR prevents reinfection. 1% said EDR technology does not play any role in response to cyber threats. So certainly the 99% are, are all in the right space that EDR plays a role in response to cyber threats, but also none of these are wholly accurate. <clears throat> As we look at you know, incident responses six plus years ago, it was incredibly rare <clears throat> that, in a, that an organization would come to us with pre-existing EDR. We would roll out a best in breed EDR tool and we conduct our investigation. In 2023, a decent percentage of clients come to us with an EDR tool in place and they say, well, well, Crawl Team, but I had 
insert name of best of breed EDR tool, why didn't it stop it? And that's the key differentiator is that with all of these modern tools, you need to be listening to the signals. You need to be listening to the alerts and you need to be actioning those signals and the alerts. Very much what we end up seeing is that more and more organizations are looking to share the responsibility of this. And so Ed, perhaps some thoughts here. Yeah, I think, well, we touched upon the, um, uh, the desire to buy something new and shiny, the desire for, for tooling, um, you know, tooling will fix the, the, the problems, tooling is the answer. Um, however, we are seeing, you know, a shortage in, in um, I guess, capacity of teams to make sure it's kind of fully configured and managed on an ongoing basis. So eyes on glass is an expensive pastime, um, and it's something that ultimately a lot of a lot of our clients are choosing not to do on a regular basis. So, hence, there is an increased demand for, for outsourcing in this space. So, I think it's no surprise to, to anybody on this call that you know the majority of, of clients that, um, that that we that we spoke to um, are using an element of outsourcing. So, whether that's you know entirely outsourced, whether that's a combination of, of in-house and, and outsourcing, this is something that addresses a number of the key concerns that, that we've kind of already flagged. Um, the talent shortages, the, 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 the burnout fatigue, um, it, gives, it gives internal teams some, some headspace. It gives them a chance to focus on, on where, where they can add value, you know, provide insights of, of how security is operating within, within the business um, and then report back, to, report back to stakeholders. So absolutely, the, um, uh, the, the, the focus on, on outsourcing, I think, is something that will just continue um, continue to take place. Um, there is a really, really interesting um, piece here around the 89% of IT and security decision makers say improvement is needed in the transparency between security between the security teams and the security vendors. I, and I think this is this speaks really well to to some of the the legacy approach to to, to actually providing security services, um, where there isn't a clear articulation of the value that cybersecurity is bringing to that business um, because the services, services hasn't, haven't been designed with um, security at the heart. And Pearson, I don't know if you've got uh, uh, any other kind of insights to, to add around this. Well, I, I think you're so right. First of all, targeting on talent shortage, right? You know, you talk to some people and they say there are a million open cybersecurity jobs. And yet, at the same time, there's a talent shortage because there are so many different disciplines of, of cyber that hiring and finding the right person is challenging. Retaining them is even harder. And so what we see is that organizations have begun to outsource more and more for a couple of reasons, and particularly in the MDR space, the managed detection response space, you know, Gartner in 2021 said by 2025, 50% of organizations will have outsourced to an MDR provider. And these statistics are telling us that we are right in line with that Gartner projection. We're, we're halfway there and we're halfway there. And I think one of the big reasons that organizations outsource their, their MDR work is it's quite a few different reasons. One, attackers are active from the other side of the world during their day, daytime hours. Those daytime hours are, in many cases, the nighttime of where your organization may be. And also, they're active on nights, weekends, and holidays. So that sock that you have to staff needs to be 24-7, 365, not, not 8 by 5. And in many cases, Staying up to date with the most recent attacker trends, tactics, protocols and procedures, those evolve on a, on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. And so if you're running your own SOC, if you're trying to do your own detection and response, your team may see only five or 10 major, what we might call high or P1 alerts per year. Whereas, and thus your team perhaps doesn't know how to respond 
as quickly, as efficiently, as effectively to those alerts. At the same time, you outsource to a team like Kroll that is looking at tens of thousands of alerts every single day. We know what different threat groups are doing today. And so ultimately, the role of outsourcing acts as the glue that connects all of your tools together, provide you those insights on best practices for the utilization of those tools, and perhaps more importantly, gets you to rapid detection and rapid response because you know, we've been saying for quite a few years now, the mark of a mature information security program is not, can you stop all threats? We've all seen 3CX, we've all seen Move It, we've all seen SolarWinds. Rather, the mark of a mature information security program is how quickly can you detect that a threat actor is in your environment? How quickly can you respond? How quickly can you eject? And how quickly can you get back to business? I think that's what builds trust. Absolutely. And I think there's a, there's a couple more points that we are you know, definitely saying are absolutely critical for organizations when they're seeking to, to build trust. So this is, this is very, close to, very close to my heart and it's something that, that I wholeheartedly believe. But the first thing is making sure that there is a long-term, all-encompassing cyber defense strategy. Um, we all too often see decisions being made in the heat of an incident or, or to, to meet somebody's requirement or because there's, you know, there's something on the news. And there's um, almost a, there's the intention to do the right thing. But when things aren't planned in a systematic and, um, I guess, gradual manner, we see mistakes being made. We see the complexity challenges. We see unnecessary um, tooling being bought. We see um, cyber risk being kind of misarticulated to to executives with with bought at all. This is you know this will this this will address all of our issues. Um, the next point around uh, is around those um, external security providers and the internal teams. Um, it, this has to be a really good relationship. I mean, these these organisations that you are uh, that you are using as an extension of your security team need to have trust. There needs to be trust there. There needs to be a transparency with the actions, with the activities, and there needs to be, um, I guess, a human relationship there, where you know that if you can reach out to them, they will do the right thing for you as an organisation. And number three that came back from, from the um, survey was actually around understanding the root cause of cyber attacks. It sounds really obvious. And I would say the next piece links into it, which is being able to articulate the root cause of the, of the attacks to executives, being able to understand why something has happened, um, not point fingers, but being able to do it in a clear and concise manner is absolutely critical. Um, so getting the basics right is, is kind of what I've pulled out, and this is homework for anybody on this call. Develop appropriate communications with executives. Um, and this is speaking directly to executives. This isn't through an intermediary where the messaging can become diluted or convoluted. This is understanding what their requirements are and how you can, um, how you can meet, meet their needs and articulating in a way that they understand. Um, and the way that they understand, we'll talk about in a second, the next piece is articulating the business case. So cybersecurity is viewed in some organizations as a tax. It's a horrible way to think about it, but if you're spending on cyber, you're not spending on um, in improving the, or growing the business. So learning to articulate how the investment in cybersecurity supports that long-term strategy that's aligned to the business strategy is absolutely critical. And lastly, sounds very, sounds very, very basic, but don't become the problem child for the business. So demonstrating appropriate management skills and learning internal business processes is absolutely key. There'll be finance cycles, so engage with stakeholders and become a contributor in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner where you are talking to executives and senior stakeholders across the business on a level. This is a relationship that you really need to invest in and that's how trust is built. And I have a theory here around what we are what we have seen and what we are definitely starting to see the, the, the impact of is a shift from cyber being sold using fear to the requirement for cyber to be sold within a business using risk. 
If you look back in five or seven years, if you invest in cyber, you won't get hacked. Or well, we need this because we're going to get hacked. And that was it. The conversation was limited. The executives weren't able to ask the next level of questions around, well, you know, what, what else can we do? Or well, the, the, the fear was was enough to trigger investment. And we've seen investment in in cybersecurity growing across across businesses, but we're still seeing incidents. So what we need to do now is articulate investment and cybersecurity from a risk perspective. If you invest in this manner, in this way, it will reduce the risk, not eradicate it completely. But it is a, a language that executives are familiar with. It's a language that other functions within businesses um, use and use very well. And it's one that cybersecurity doesn't necessarily um, leverage as much as it should. Pearson? I, I think you're so spot on with this. The language of fear only works for so long until it's the chicken little effect, at which point an organization begins to discount the concerns. And concerns may be valid, but if they're not messaged in the right way, th there, there's no win, there's no, there's no gain. Organizations understand that language of risk and when they understand the language of risk, and if you can communicate as such, ultimately that is showing maturity in your organization, that's showing maturity in your program because you can take the actionable, what's happening elsewhere after you've conducted that internal risk assessment, where are our low points, where are our gaps, where are our compliance controls that are perhaps missing, and how do we properly allow our organization ultimately to move from assumptions to move to assurance? And together we see that as a, a powerful movement in the ability to harness your people, your process and your technology in such a way that your technology is doing exactly what you expect it to do, <clears throat> right? We say that IT is the field of does it work? Security is the field of, but how does it fail? And so that tightly dialed in controls and configurations, the simplest of infrastructure, complex enough to do the job and simple enough not to be burdensome to an organization. And so as we move to the end, and, and certainly thank you for joining us this morning and this afternoon, this evening, there's a concerning inconsistency between the level of trust organizations have in their readiness to achieve true cyber resilience. Without confidence in their security tools and teams, it's difficult for organizations to obtain a robust security maturity. When trust in people or in processes is misplaced or excessive, it itself can present further security threats to organizations. And security tools without management does not make a business more secure. And in many cases, can make a business less secure. Because what most people don't realize is that EDR tools to function, modern EDR tools, need to be advised of other EDR tools through an allow list. And those allow lists, and this analogy works for so many different security tools, ultimately gives blind spots. And when you buy more security tools, in many cases, you're creating more blind spots for your team. And the blind spots are where the attackers live, the blind spots are how the attackers move, and the blind spots are ultimately how you get a post-paid penetration test without your initial contracting authority. Excellent. And because I guess what we're trying to do is, is give everybody some actions. So we told you some of the challenges. So what are what can you do right now? What are the things that everybody on this call should be doing? Um, the first piece is really around making sure you stay up to date with, with the evolving cyber threats. It sounds simple, but make sure you've got a good intelligence feed that's relevant for your organization. We spoke about some of the lack of trust around the um, threat intelligence feeds that are coming in. Well, assess whether they're relevant for you. Make sure that they are adding value to you as an organization, that you're able to process um, 
and action the information that's coming in. It can't just be a side of, you know, the side of someone's desk kind of activity that's done on a, you know, monthly basis. This has to be, you know, dedic a dedicated activity with, with resources that, that know what they're know what they're doing. The next one is to understand the capabilities of the tools that you've got. And this is tricky because it means understanding exactly what each of your tools do um, and how they relate to your own environments. So what are they protecting? What are they alerting about? You know, being able to, um, to, to have on a single sheet of paper all the tools that you have um, and the capabilities that they are providing is incredibly valuable, but it's complex. So I would just, you know, take that away as an action, look at how the, the tools are, are, are overlapping with potentially, you know, there are blind spots. We've heard that um, threat actors live in those blind spots. Let's try to remove as many of them as possible. The next one really is about gaining external validation um, and an independent perspective of cybersecurity within your organization. Um, financial statements are audited and they're audited for a good reason because they're important to organizations and other people rely on them. There's a, um, th th there's a level of assurance that's needed around this important space. It's no different to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a key risk for any organization. Controls that you have in place um, are being relied on by yourselves and you know, the, uh, I guess um, by proxy, senior management, stakeholders, stakeholders, shareholders, investors, all of these all, all of these individuals. So um, seek comfort and look to gain assurance that, that your controls are operating in a manner that is uh, consistent with your own perception of them. And lastly, think about getting breathing space for your own team. Um, by by leveraging kind of MDR, we've seen this as an industry trend. We've seen some of the benefits that you can get around the threat intel, the um, the eyes on glass that these services provide you. And the knock on impact is that you get um, breathing space for your own team, so you can add value in your own way by further aligning cybersecurity objectives to your business own objectives, to your business's own objectives. Um, so those are the four things that we are recommending that every organisation does. Yes. Absolutely. And as we <clears throat> as we move here towards the end, and as we talk about you know, the, the threat life cycle, certainly there are many reasons why organizations trust Crawl. Could it be the 100,000 hours per year of offensive security and penetration testing work that we conduct? Could it be that we're on panel for 60 different cyber insurance carriers? Absolutely. Could it be the 3,000 IR engagements we do per year, yes. But we'd sure love to meet you left of boom, whether it's the security advisory and penetration testing under Ed's team, whether it's the managed detection response with my team, whether it's threat intelligence with the incomparable Keith Wojcik. But in the event that you're in the middle of an incident, our teams stand by 24 seven, 365, nights, weekends, and holidays to help you with both incident response and breach notification. So. We're going to leave you with our email addresses on the next slide. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them into that question box there and we'll get to them. If questions come up later, shoot us an email. And if we don't have the right answer, we'll bring in the right Crawl expert to help you. Thanks so much yep. for joining us. And we'll jump into questions now to Leo. Great. Thank you, Pearson. Thank you, Ed. Awesome session. Um, in the background, we've gotten a couple, uh, three questions thus far, uh, but just want to remind everyone, you have a GoToWebinar client floating in one of your monitors somewhere. You can use the chat function to submit questions. Uh, but let me start with a really interesting question that I think uh, could lead to some debate here. But John is asking, what is your take on where cyber should live within a company uh, under operations, under legal? Um, he's saying, as you know, general counsel, conventional wisdom is that you know cybersecurity lives under legal to protect privilege in, in the event of an investigation, and you know to protect overall you know uh, in the event of, of an incident. Do you, do you have a take on that? Where where should cyber live within an organization? What a question, John. Thank you so much. Pearson, did you want to start or do you want me to, to, to dive into this one? 
I was going to flip it to you since you're since you're the former CISO and I only see organizations that are in pain. Absolutely. So you're going to hate me, John. It depends. Um, so that's so we know where it shouldn't sit is probably the first thing to say. That's the that's one way of getting around it, right? So we know, and I I I, um, I, I can hear the groans among those that are still on the line. But it shouldn't sit under IT. It should fundamentally be different to IT because it is. It's an evolution of IT. It's providing a level of assurance and oversight, um, and it has to sit something differently. So having cyber and IT reporting into the same person for me is a big no-no. So yes, whether it sits under general counsel uh, is is up to the business to decide. I've seen it report up by uh, um, health and safety in some organizations. So if you think about um, any organizations with a, with a big OTM, so um, where there's a merging of operations and technology and there's human life at risk and big machines operating, then often cyber is, is very nicely aligned to, to making sure that people are safe. So one of my colleagues, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, John George, um, will spout OT security at you uh, until both you and him are fed up. He's the absolute SME in this space. And he would absolutely back me up by saying that in organizations where there's no tier limit, health and safety. Under general counsel, yes, it makes sense in a lot of cases. Invoking legal privilege uh, is something that I think Pearson would potentially be more familiar with, but you don't have to have cyber reporting up into general counsel in order to invoke legal privilege if in the event of an incident, it's my understanding. So if that was a primary consideration for making that decision, then I would encourage you to potentially look at that again, but I would defer to Pearson um, for his experience in this space. I, I fundamentally agree, Ed, with everything that you've said. It depends, and it depends on the both the construct and the makeup of an organization, how that organization handles risk, how that organization addresses risk, and where that organization sits on operations v risk as the teeter totter for how decisions are made you know we we had said it asked the question of does it work security asked the question of but how does it fail and <clears throat> Ed, as you pointed out yes if you have one person trying to do both try as they may to have security win operations somehow in many cases finds a way to win one two if you have security reporting up to it operations finds a way to win i'll throw out another idea and that is what if you have it reporting to security <laughs> and does that become what security of the future looks like because ultimately so many senior leadership functions are risk management functions infosec is a risk management function protecting the organization IT is the operational enabler. And so could that be reporting up to that and thus your CIO or CTO report to your CISO? Yeah, I mean, even just within this, we could talk about this for an extended period of time. But if you look at the traditional kind of three lines of defense model, cybersecurity kind of sits somewhere in the middle of one and two. So you often hear the, the 1.5 kind of lines of defense. And, I've done engagements where you sit down with organizations and you try and work out, are we classifying them as cybersecurity, as you know, first line or second line, and we ultimately we end up with somewhere in the middle. So what we can say is that cybersecurity should be embedded within the business. It should be able to interact and listen to stakeholders. It should be given a seat at, at the table when decisions are being made. Um, but ultimately it needs oversight as well. So a good Governance structure is is absolutely critical. Making sure that stakeholders are engaged um, and informed is is key. Uh, gentlemen, to that end, we've gotten a couple more questions, but there's there's one that is super relevant um, from uh, Sarah. Sarah is asking uh, about the intersection between infosec and legal, specifically in the event of an incident, right? Um, uh, uh, her question is around, um, in the past, there have been disconnects between 
infosec knowing when and how to engage legal and you know how to manage that process when when legal should be involved or shouldn't um, do you have any tips for a better collaboration between infosec and legal right given that you just recommended that legal doesn't have to report to the dc how should both teams be aligned when, when they need to so there are two types of organizations yep organizations that have had an incident <clears throat> and organizations that haven't organizations that have in many cases um, <clears throat> know the proper chain of commands because that was written in the heat of battle. The organizations that haven't, if you're not running tabletops, you should be. Tabletops that bring the constituents to the table, running through mock scenarios, running through and understanding and sitting down with this fictional scenario where your GC, where your outside counsel have the opportunity to make suggestions of, hey, when to bring us in and with a quick advisory and when to say, hey, this is a problem and this is important. And so building those <clears throat> building those relationships, building the foundation of those relationships long before you ever need them, right? Because a big instant response is, in many cases, your instant response firm is hired by outside counsel on behalf of the client in what's called a tri-party relationship where Kroll is hired by outside law firm to help client and that way everything is wrapped in client attorney privilege and the attorney work product doctrine. But that very first step of when the senior IT leader or senior infosec leader reaches out to legal and says, we have a problem. That's one that, yes, there should be a continuous open line of communication. And what we're seeing is more and more, certainly larger organizations have a member of the law department, a member of the legal team, who is specially dedicated to, or one of their roles and responsibilities is cyber. <clears throat> and that way a relationship can be fostered over time. Uh, I think, yeah, my two cents, I think the tabletop piece is absolutely critical. Um, when you do these tabletop exercises, and we do lots of them, right? Everybody brings a different view to the table. Everybody has a different perspective. That they that they add legal legal view is is absolutely vital in these situations. But then equally, so is the view from HR, so is the view from finance, the, the business ops. Um, all of these individuals and the departments that they represent, a good response is only possible when the right stakeholders are in the room and they are empowered um, to, to to make decisions on behalf of the organisation. So yes, practice, 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 um, and. Also bear in mind that regulations around cybersecurity are increasing. So um, the likes of DORA in, in, in Europe is bringing, bringing into, into play increased kind of reporting for of, of significant or major security or ICT incidents. GDPR has already brought in mandatory notification to, to oversight bodies um, or supervisory bodies. So, Yes, any department in cyber that is trying to shy away from their relationship with legal should be brought sharply back into line um, by, by the wider organization at play. Excellent. Uh, thank you both. Uh, we got a few minutes left. Maybe we can tackle this one last question, which is a little more technical uh, than we've discussed thus far. But the question is uh, pretty interesting. Endpoints or identity, where are you seeing the most threats? And if MDR is primarily focused on endpoints, um, what is a really good way for managing identity threats? Uh, is it through MDR or somewhere else? Ed, do you want to take that one or would you like me to? 500, 500 responses, Pearson. I would be foolish to attempt to answer that. <laughs> so this is a fun one. And you know, we've talked, uh, if you talk about the models of security maturity, <clears throat> we went from the, uh, the onion, I'm sorry, the, um, the castle wall model of security many, 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 many years ago. Firewall and a virus are good. That took us to the onion model of security, layers of control, defense and depth. We moved to assumed incident, assumed breach. At about the time of 2020, we started moving into endpoint as the perimeter. Ultimately, everybody's trying to get to zero trust. 
But to get to zero trust, you have to go through identity as the perimeter first. And so I think it's a really, really great question. What we end up finding is that in many cases, the identity-based attacks occur through the endpoint. And so while it's incredibly important that you need to know who your users are and that your users are your users and not someone subverting the credentials. And I will say, Perl has seen a dramatic uptick in adversary in the middle style attacks during Q2 of this year. It is, it is simply dramatic. Um, and so if you're not looking at either, whether it's the, the, the marketing term of phishing resistant to MFA uh, or hardware keys or certificates on endpoints, uh, MFA is now, when left to be a wide open control, uh, attackers are finding ways by it, unfortunately, uh, which is the evolution of security. It is, it is a cat and mouse game. And so the, the hardening controls around identity, the locking down of access to those devices which you control and harden, uh, I think very much what we're gonna end up seeing is that endpoint is the perimeter, identity is the perimeter, it is, a, is a loop that continues to power itself. Ed? Yeah, one thing I would say is, yes, zero trust is is the way that a lot of organizations are, are going in. And I feel like this, you know, goes to the, the heart of the question. Um, what I would say and just kind of, I guess, reemphasize is that organizations are on a journey. Solving the ch cybersecurity won't be solved by investing a boatload in a particular technology. I mean, the, if that's essentially, I know, I don't want to read into it too much, but um, there is a risk, and you can see how it's how this has suddenly emerged, right? The, this, this new approach to to managing risk within an environment. Um, is there something else that, that could be done where you're kind of using less um, less financial investment within within an organisation to better improve your um, to improve your security in that particular instance? You know, potentially with the, the number of times you go into organisations where the existing tech hasn't been optimized. So what I would say is, yes, consider, you know, the think kind of three to five years ahead, but let's get the basics right. Let's make sure that we have everything buttoned up before you know, going on and doing significant investment in, you know, these big bang kind of panacea type projects. Again, I might not be, uh, I've read into to, to that question, so forgive me for, for Interpreting. No, I, I think you both nailed it and we're right at time. So let me just take this uh, last minute to thank everyone for their questions. Uh, if we haven't been able to answer it now live, uh, we'll try and answer them via email over the next few days. And again, thank you to the speakers for taking the time. Thank you to everyone that registered and attended. Um, if you do have questions, both Pearson and Ad's email are available and they'll be um, uh, around to answer them. But I hope you join us for the next webinar and that you enjoy the report, uh, those of you that have downloaded it. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Take care.